about there. Great. Hello. Uh, so my name is Aaron Doran. I, too, have a sweet bee pin. So <laughs> consider that. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, times were bad, man. Uh, the Spanish Civil War had ended, and Franco was in power. Perhaps as thanks for their support during the war, Franco was allowing the Nazis to kick it in Spain and distribute propaganda. Uh, by now, the Nazis had invaded Poland and were making their way across the rest of Europe. Despite the Spanish censors' best efforts, people were hearing the reports of brutality, deaths, and even rumors of camps. This leads us to Madrid, where we find Juan Pujol Garcia. At this point, he was working as the manager of the Hotel Majestic, a hotel which was anything but. One was a rambuxist child growing up roughly upper middle class, uh, a pacifist and humanist like his father, with the ability to charm his way through anything. He did his best to stay out of the Civil War, but it didn't work out. Um, so he carried with him some horrible experiences of that time. Um, as he read the reports of what was happening in the rest of Europe, Juan realized he had to get involved. While he felt the Spanish Civil War was fought between two extremes, neither of which were truly the good guys, this war was different. This war, it was clear what side was fighting for good. As he would later be quoted, I wanted to start a personal war with Hitler, and I wanted to fight with my imagination. So, on a January day in 1941, Juan walked into the British Embassy to offer his services. What services were those? Well, he was pretty vague on that front, since he wasn't really sure what those services were either. Uh, first, he offered to produce radio shows for the BBC, but it was unclear what he meant by that. The receptionist told him to talk to someone else in the embassy, and Juan spent his day bouncing around the various lower runs of embassy staff. Until finally, someone said, all right, Put your, proposal in white, put your proposal in writing, and I'll take a look at it. Um, even being in the British Embassy, writing down a proposal to work for the Brits felt like too big a risk, given the strong influence Nazi Germany had over Madrid. So he walked out, set back, but not defeated. If his offer was too vague and too weak to be taken seriously now, he'd just have to come back with a better offer. And then that's when his mind turned to espionage. He was a charming guy. He knew how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> he could work as an informant for the Allies. Even better, he'd be a double agent. So, step one, get German intelligence. Uh, one calls the German embassy and demands to speak with the military attache directly. He has an offer to help serve the Nazi cause. He's told to call back the next day, which he does, and is instructed to be at the Café Leon at 4.30 the next afternoon. He's to look for a fair-haired man in a light suit with a raincoat over his arm. Ooh. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, uh, so, as instructed, he goes to the cafe and meets Frederico, a Nazi spy. Juan sits down, introduces himself, and when asked why he wants to work for the Nazis, launches into this long, enthusiastic, enth enthusiastic monologue, professing his love for the Nazi cause, perhaps even going a little overboard in trying to sell it. Um, Juan also claims that he has numerous government contacts that he could plug for information. And while Frederico doesn't seem to fully buy it, Juan scores a second meeting. During the second meeting, Federico tells Juan that while he appreciates his offer to assist, the Abvor really don't need more agents in Spain. They need people outside the country. Fortunately, Juan has a passport, which makes him instantly valuable to the Abvor. Having a passport was a real twist of luck since they were very hard to get at the time. I just tragically don't have time to tell you how Juan got the passport, but know that it involves smuggling scotch for princesses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, now that the Germans know Juan can leave the country, he needs a reason for the Germans to invest in him. Juan starts to make up a story about the Dalamal affair, a plot wherein a Spanish agent is purchasing British currency that Spain desperately needs. 
and it just so happens Juan has an in. If the, Juan, if the Germans can help Juan get a visa to Britain, he can try to join the operation and begin spying on Germany's behalf. Federico balks at the proposition, but a few meetings later, he gives Juan some money and instructs him to make his way to Lisbon and report back when he is able to get an exit visa, which is surprisingly easy to do following this 15-step program. So, how to become a Nazi in 15 easy steps. One, go to Lisbon. Two, be rejected by the Spanish embassy for a British visa. Three, drink in bars wondering what to do next. Four, meet a man with a Spanish diplomatic visa. Five, befriend that guy. Six, offer to go to a trip to, to go to a trip to a casino with your new friend. Seven, get stomach cramps while gambling and say you need to go back to your room. Eight, rummage through your friend's luggage and take pictures of their visa. Nine, use photos to get a plate engraved to recreate the visa. 10, go to a printer, pretend to be a government official, order 200 copies of the visa because ordering one is suspicious. <laughs> Go to a stamp maker, claim your stamp to you emboss government seals on visas are going bad and ask for a new stamp based on a photo. <laughs> 12, paste your headshot on your fake visa. 13, tell the Nazis a wild story about your involvement in currency smuggling while in Lisbon. 14, show your handler Federico the fake visa. 15, you are now officially a Nazi spy. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, after showing off the fake visa to Frederico, Juan becomes an official spy for the Nazis. He is given the code name of Arabelle, along with invisible ink, cipher codes, and a large sum of cash. He's told to head for England and begin reporting on the activities of the British forces. Instead, he packs up the family and leaves for Portugal. Hey, uh, his fake visa was good enough to fool Frederico, but not good enough to get him into Britain. He also knows that he can't stay in Madrid lest he be noticed. So that leaves his only escape is Lisbon. Um, and then once in Lisbon, he makes another go at offering to spy for the British. This time, able to say he is an actual Nazi spy that wants to defect. He is rebuffed again. <laughs> you, may be wonder, you may be wondering to yourself, what are the Brits doing? You may also be wondering that for other reasons these days. But <laughs> in this case, there is at least a reason that feels acceptable. Um, see, Spain was neutral in the war, and uh, the last thing the Brits needed was Spain joining the Axis powers. In an effort to prevent any diplomatic boondoggles and keep Spain out of the war, Britain was rejecting any and all offers of aid from Spanish citizens. Left to craft intelligence for the Nazis, we encounter the major flaw in Juan's plan. He's never been to England, and he speaks little English. Um, he knows basically nothing of the British people, culture, military structure, or really anything. So Juan is trapped in Lisbon, unable to get help from the Brits, and needing to send useful intelligence to the Nazis, lest he be found out to be a fraud. So he does what any smart person does, and he hits up the library, which... <laughs> Really, which really says to me that you too can help fight Nazis with a trip to your local library. <laughs> so Juan picks up travel guides, maps, train schedules, and anything else with information about the UK. He also watches for any news reports, leaflets, and anything else that has any information he can spin into a story about what the British military is up to. For one thing Juan learned early on is that the best lies hold a little kernel of truth. There's one other problem he needs to solve. He's in Lisbon and is supposed to be mailing letters from Britain. The Lisbon postmarks on his envelopes will give away the ruse be long before the Nazis even, we Nazis even read Juan's first letter. So Juan gets creative and concocts the first, me first member of his network of fictional sub-agents. Uh, Juan tells the Nazis that to ensure secure transit of his letters, he has convinced the pilot that runs the regular KLM route from London to Lisbon to deliver Juan's letters to a security deposit box in Lisbon. Then Juan drops off the key for the box at the German embassy before leaving for Britain. Um, what Juan does not know, but is an all-time coincidence, is that the pilot that's working that route 
actually works for British intelligence. <laughs> Um, Juan continued to expand his network of fictional sub-agents uh, to use his sources for his totally real and accurate intelligence reports. These sub-agents worked as a shield to protect, wrong, to protect Juan as any inaccuracies in his reports can be blamed on a sub-agent who can then be summarily dismissed for their failures. Everything is now set in place. Juan begins sending reports from Britain using intelligence collected by him and his sub-agents. The Nazis took every report seriously such as the time he reported on a convoy of ships leaving from Liverpool and sailing to Malta. The convoy was not real, but the British did observe German U-boats and Italian warplanes along, along the reported convoy route, hoping to intercept the convoy. Funnily enough, the Nazis blamed the Italians for missing the convoy, not Arabelle's intelligence. <laughs> Though, like I had mentioned before, one uh, was not familiar with British culture, so there were some inaccuracies in his reports. At one time, in talking about longshoremen in Glasgow, he said they'd do anything for a liter of wine <laughs> instead of, you know, like ale and whiskey. Um, he had trouble understanding British currency since the denominations did not match up to a decimal system yet. So he reported most of his expenses in shilling and pence instead of pounds. Um, but despite any red flags, he still had the Nazis eating out of his hand. There was se enough seemingly true information in his reports for the Nazis to maintain absolute faith in him. The one time they questioned the accuracy of his reports, he replied with a bluff, stated with such anger and fury that they never dared question him again. <laughs> Even with more proof that he was a Nazi spy, Juan was still unable to get the attention of the British. Every day that Juan wrote reports filled with ruses, lies, and minimal information was another day he was putting his operation at risk, along with his family. Finally, Juan's wife, Araceli Gonzalez Carballo, figured out a way to save the day. So now, from what little, able, what little info I was able to find, Araceli is every bit as charming, brave, intelligent, and wily as Juan is. However, I assume because they divorced some time after the war, she was cut out of Juan's memoirs. So that has helped to obscure her place in this story. Um, I want to talk about her a lot more, but just know that she was there kicking ass the whole time as much as Juan was. So anyway, by this point, the United States had entered the war. Rather than try her luck with the British again, she approached the Americans saying she had information on German spies and she was willing to sell for an outrageous sum. Um, so after producing proof she had what she was selling, she, uh, the, Ameri the Americans set up a meeting with British intelligence um, right away where Araceli reveals that the German spy was none other than her own husband and they wanted nothing more than to help the allied cause. Finally, finally, they, get, they were able to get the full attention of the British, and Juan was flown out to England to meet with MI5. What Juan doesn't know is that the British were already aware of the Nazi agent Arabelle. They just didn't know his identity. So the British had successfully cracked the ciphers used by the Abwehr and set up radio towers to intercept encoded messages between Lisbon and Berlin. So MI5 had been, MI5 had been incept, intercepting transmitted versions of Juan's letters the whole time. Juan had caused a bit of panic for MI5 as they had tracked down every other Nazi spy in the UK and then suddenly there was this agent, Arabelle, claiming to be in their borders. Even worse, they could find no sign of him. Worse still, some of his intelligence even happened to be right. <laughs> When MI5 was told about their meeting with Juan, they were able to put together the pieces that he was Arabelle. The British brought Juan into the fold and made him a full agent of MI5 and part of the famed double cross system. They gave him the code name of Garbo, um, named after the actress Greta Garbo. Juan's long journey from hotel manager that feels the call to action to double agent for the allies is finally complete. Hey, but, this is just the first act in the full story of Agent Garbo. Throughout the Second World War, he would continue to work in the double-cross system for MI5. 
Garbo is most remembered for his work on Operation Fortitude, a disinformation campaign to convince the Nazis that D-Day was happening just about anywhere but Normandy. I didn't get a chance to look too deeply into this, but he also apparently faked his own death shortly after the war, eventually resurfacing decades later. <laughs> Truly a spy for the ages. So, I'd like to raise, I'd like to raise my glass to Araceli Gonzalez Carballo and Juan Pujol Garcia. No matter what challenges you are presented with, if it is the right thing, press on, no matter where the path takes you. Thank you.